All right, good morning and welcome to take two of our Insights program with Flint Whitlock. Uh, we had a minor technical glitch last week and so we just figured we would redo it for you guys to give you a chance to watch his uh, wonderful presentation on YouTube. Uh, so as a quick introduction, Flint Whitlock is a local uh, Denver historian. He's the author of 14 books, including his very first one with Soldiers on Skis, a history of the 10th Mountain Division uh, in which his father served. He is also a battlefield tour guide and the, uh, a board member of the Broomfield uh, Veterans Memorial Museum up in Broomfield, which is also an excellent museum, and I recommend that you stop by for a visit. So without further ado, here's Flint Whitlock. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to welcome you all to my presentation today uh, entitled The 10th Mountain Division Skiing Off to War. Uh, it's a story of the 10th Mountain Division in World War II and today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just tell you that my talk today is based on my book entitled Soldiers on Skis, which is a complete history of the division during World War II. My father happened to be a member of the division, trained here in Colorado, went off to war in Italy with the division. And so without further ado, let's begin with skiing off to war. To get an idea of how special the 10th Mountain Division was, I think it's important to understand the historical context of mountain and winter warfare. Back in 218 BC, the Carthaginian general Hannibal took his elephant army across the Alps to attack Rome. During our own Revolutionary War, Washington's troops suffered during their winter encampment at Valley Forge. Napoleon's drive to capture Moscow in 1812 was turned back by the ravages of winter. Swedish troops were perhaps the first soldiers to go into battle on skis in the 1800s. There was mountain warfare in the Alps during World War I. And between the World Wars, various nations experimented with specialized ski and mountain troops. In the Russo-Finnish War of 1939-1940, outnumbered Finnish forces inflicted heavy casualties on the invading Soviet army. In 1939, Hitler unleashed his army on Poland and then on Norway in April 1940. Italy too got into the act and invaded longtime rival Greece, but things went badly. 10,000 Italians died of exposure in the Greek mountains in addition to 25,000 battle deaths. This forced Hitler to send German divisions in to help the Italians in Greece. At the start of the war, Germany had three mountain divisions. By the end, they would have 14, each one superbly trained to fight in the harsh Alpine regions. How many mountain divisions did the U.S. have at that time? Absolutely none. But one man saw this deficiency and was determined to do something about it. His name was Charles Minot Dole. They called him Mini Dole, and he was the president and head of the National Ski Patrol System. He saw the war coming and knew that if the U.S. got involved in the war, that we were unprepared for any sort of combat that might take place in cold and mountainous regions. He wrote hundreds of letters to President Roosevelt and Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall, urging them to recruit and train a force capable of mountain warfare. But FDR and Marshall weren't interested. If the U.S. got involved in the war, they said, we would need more regular troops, not specialized forces such as mountain divisions. But Dole persisted until he finally convinced FDR and Marshall that mountain troops would be essential. Probably just to get Dole off their backs, Marshall gave Dole the go-ahead to recruit just such a force. It was the first time in history that the U.S. authorized a civilian agency to recruit a military unit. Dole was elated, and since he knew just about everyone in the ski patrol across the country, as well as everyone associated with skiing and mountaineering, he sent out a call for volunteers. To be considered for acceptance, an applicant had to have a spotless record and would need three letters of recommendation from coaches, teachers, pastors, and the like. A lot of young men must have wanted to join the mountain troops because the recruiters received 15,000 applications. The fledgling division also needed lumberjacks, cowboys, rodeo riders, blacksmiths, and forest rangers. 
tough men who were accustomed to living and working and surviving in the outdoors. But why cowboys and blacksmiths? Because the tent would have thousands of pack mules and horses that would need to be trained and taken care of. So men such as Jim Like, a champion rodeo rider from Southern Colorado joined up. So did Paul Petzold, a member of the first US climbing team to attempt to summit K2, the world's second highest mountain. And Peter Gabriel, a Swiss mountaineer and head of the ski school at Franconia, New Hampshire. And Austrian Walter Prager, the Dartmouth College ski team coach. Champion Austrian ski racers, Tony Mott and Lugi Folger also enlisted. The tent had hundreds of foreign born skiers and mountaineers in its ranks. The tent became a who's who of skiers. There was the Austrian ski racer, Friedel Pfeiffer, who would help start the Aspen ski area after the war. John Jay, who was making ski movies before Warren Miller got his first skis. Steve Knowlton, an American college and Olympic skier. Pete Seibert, a college skier who would one day be one of the founders of Vail. And Dick Durrance, a professional ski racer who taught many of the 10th boys how to ski. There might even have been a bear tamer or two. Probably the most famous skier to join the 10th was Norwegian Torger Tokla, the holder of the world's record in the ski jump. There were also a slew of ordinary guys, such as my father, Jim Whitlock, who was from Chicago and had never seen a mountain or a pair of skis until he joined the 10th. In late 1941, the first element of what would eventually become the 87th Take Two. In late 1941, the first element of what would eventually become the 10th Mountain Division began training at Mount Rainier, Washington. The US was finally thrust into the war when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 and the troops at Mount Rainier stepped up their training while the army went looking for a permanent home. The army found it at a swampy overgrown place called Eagle Park, located 100 miles west of Denver, high up in the Rockies between Minturn and Leadville. There was a railroad line and a small whistle stop known as Panda, and here the army decided to build what became known as Camp Hale. I've circled the location here along Highway 24, 250,000 acres of private and public lands. But where did the name Hale come from? It came from Brigadier General Irving Hale, who had graduated from Denver East High School in 1877, went to West Point, and graduated in 1884, with the highest grade point average in the school's history. During the Spanish-American War, he led Colorado's regiment that captured the Philippine capital, Manila. And after the war, he was one of the founders of the VFW. Here you see engineers straightening the Eagle River that runs through the site. And here's a shot of the camp after the swamp was drained and it was cleared of most of the foliage. An army of 10,000 civilian workmen began building the camp. Here you see some of the barracks going up. When finished, Camp Hale would have almost a thousand buildings. Well, what do you think it cost? $30 million in 1942 dollars. And it was all completed between April and November of 1942. Here's a view of the completed camp looking to the north and a view of the other half of the camp looking to the south. The entire valley was filled with what became Colorado's largest city, over 15,000 men. There were also over 240 members of the Women's Army Corps stationed there. The 99th Infantry Battalion, mostly made up of native-born Norwegians, was also stationed at Camp Hale. Their hope was to be sent to Norway to liberate their country. In the lower right, you see Franklin Roosevelt talking with one of the Norwegians at Camp Hale. In August 1943, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment of the 10th became part of Operation Cottage, a joint U.S.-Canadian operation to evict a force of Japanese that had invaded and occupied Kiska Island in the Aleutian chain. Here's the large armada involved in the invasion at Kiska Harbor. And here are American troops coming ashore. A group of Japanese midget submarines. What the invading force didn't know was that the Japanese had secretly evacuated Kiska 
a few days before Operation Cottage was launched. When the troops landed, they rushed up the barren, fog-shrouded slopes and began firing blindly at any noise they heard. Unfortunately, they were shooting at each other. There were casualties. 313 Americans and Canadians were killed by friendly fire and booby traps, and 2,500 were wounded. 17 of the dead and 50 of the wounded were from the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment. In January 1944, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment ended its occupation of Kisco and returned to Camp Hale, where it joined two other newly formed regiments, the 85th and 86th. The 10th was now complete. Training the entire division could continue, climbing cliffs and mountains in the summer, ice climbing in the winter, and learning how to ski the Army way by the numbers. Troopers learned how to snowplow on Cooper Hill and learned how to sidestep up a steep slope with 90 pounds of rucksack strapped to their backs. The men of the 10th were probably the most well-conditioned soldiers in the entire U.S. or any other army. The 4,000 mules were also well-trained, for in mountainous terrain where there are no roads on which a truck or jeep can travel, sure-footed animals are the only way to carry supplies. The 10th also became known as what I call the guinea pig division because the army was always sending various prototypes of equipment to Camp Hale so that the men of the 10th could try it out and report on what worked and what didn't. Trying to find a vehicle that would operate in the snow was one example. Here's a one-man Jeep, an early forerunner of the snowmobile, a snowcap. The vehicle deemed most successful was a Studebaker M29 Weasel that could carry cargo, passengers, or tow a line of men on skis. But it was hard to beat the old-fashioned dog sled. And when the machines and mules and dogs didn't work, the men became the pack animals. Somebody even tried to put snowshoes on mules. Not a very successful idea. Because so many of the mountain troopers were from rich families and Ivy League colleges or were exotic Europeans, the men of the tent soon became known as the Glamour Boys and got more than their fair share of publicity. Life magazine ran a feature on the division and the Saturday Evening Post had a cover illustration featuring a ski trooper in white camouflage. Even Warner Brothers made a film at Camp Hale called Mountain Fighters. Training went on all year long, no matter what the weather. And frankly, the men were getting bored of doing nothing but training and worrying that they were going to miss the war. KP duty, they felt, was beneath their dignity and skills. And they wondered when, if ever, they would see combat and be able to put their skills to the test. They were like an elite football team that practiced continually, but never played in a real game. Morale began to sink. To amuse themselves, one weekend, a group of tent men came into Denver, went up to the top floor of the Brown Palace Hotel's atrium, and rappelled down into the lobby. The guests were delighted, hotel management not so much. The war was passing the tent by. In November of 1942, about the time that Camp Hale was completed, the American army invaded North Africa and finally met the Germans on the field of battle. In July 1943, when the 10th's training was in full swing, the Allies invaded Sicily, and then in September, southern Italy. The march up the Italian peninsula stalled along the Germans' defensive line, anchored at Monte Cassino. To get around the line, the Allies tried an end run, landing up the coast of Anzio, 40 miles from Rome, but that advance too stalled. It wasn't until June 4, 1944, that Rome finally fell followed two days later by the invasion of Northern France, known as Operation Overlord. But the 10th Mountain Division was still back in the States, playing war games in a remote Colorado Valley. They had done well during the B-Series maneuvers in February and March 1944, in spite of blizzards and minus 40 degree temperatures. But it seemed that the Army didn't know what to do with the 10th. They were too specialized. Their artillery was too small. And there were those 4,000 mules. Rumor had it that the 10th was to be broken up and then parceled out as replacements to other divisions that had suffered heavy casualties. But then, in the summer of 1944, new orders came down 
and the 10th was told to get on troop trains and head to Camp Swift, Texas for some flatland training. Camp Swift, Texas near Austin was every mountain man's nightmare. Hot, humid, dusty, and without a mountain in sight. Men got drunk, morale plummeted. Some went, went AWOL or requested transfers to the Airborne or Marines or other units. But then something happened. The 10th got a new commanding general. George P. Hayes, a real war hero. He had been awarded the Medal of Honor in World War I. He knew nothing about skiing or mountain warfare, but he knew how to lead men. Late in 1944, the 10th left Camp Swift and headed for Virginia, where they boarded troop ships and sailed eastward across the Atlantic. The 10th, the last division to go overseas, was headed for Italy. General Mark Clark, head of the Allied forces in Italy, needed fresh troops to break the stalemate that had developed in the northern Apennines in the fall of 44. The fact that the 10th was specially trained for mountain warfare was exactly what Clark needed. A side note, after the 10th had left Camp Hale, part of it was turned into a German POW camp, one of 40 such camps in Colorado. With Camp Hale of no further use to the Army, it was dismantled. Back to Italy. In January 1945, the 10th arrived in Naples Harbor and was transported to the north of Pisa, where it was inserted into the front line. This is part of what their sector looked like. A five mile long, 3,000 foot high series of connected peaks called Riva Ridge. Riva Ridge and Monte Belvedere to the east guarded the road that led into the Po River Valley. German observers atop Riva Ridge could see any movement in the valley below and call down artillery fire upon it. Several attempts to take Belvedere had already failed by the time the 10th got there. The Army didn't think that the untried 10th Mountain Division that had gained a reputation as Eisenhower's playboys back in the States had any chance of doing any better than the other divisions that had already tried to take Belvedere and failed, but decided to give General Hayes's men a shot at it. The 10th saw that the key to taking Belvedere was for the, hmm, take two. The 10th saw that the key to taking Belvedere was first knocking out the German observers on Riva Ridge. Routes to the top of Riva Ridge were plotted up the steep slopes that the Germans thought no one could climb. And on the night of February 18th and 19th, a thousand men climbed silently up the steep slopes and overwhelmed the Germans on top. By noon on the 19th, most of Riva Ridge was in 10th hands. The next day, the rest of the division climbed Belvedere, and after a few days of savage fighting, a way had been forced through the northern Apennines. The U.S. Army was astonished. One of the rewards of being victorious in battle is that you get more battle. And so the 10th was selected to spearhead a limited offensive in March 1945. Again, the 10th was successful. So they were picked to spearhead the entire 5th Army offensive to break into the Po River Valley. Here's a map showing the 10th's route of march in April 1945. During this offensive, the 10th staged the Army's last horse-mounted cavalry charge in battle. The charge did not go well, and casualties were heavy. In fact, April 14th marked the heaviest day of casualties for the 10th in their entire time in combat. Torger Tokla, the world record holder in the ski jump, was killed, along with John McGrath, the only 10th man to earn the Medal of Honor. There was another casualty. Second Lieutenant Bob Dole was a platoon leader who was hit while attacking the German machine gun nest. He nearly lost his right arm and spent many months in Army hospitals. But the 10th was the first American unit to reach the Po River and the first one to cross it using inflatable rafts. Once on the north side of the Po, the 10th led the way in chasing the Germans towards the Alps. The 10th assistant division commander was wounded during this drive, and so Bill Darby, the man who had founded the Army Rangers, took over as assistant division commander. He was killed two days before the Germans surrendered. The 10th reached Lake Garda, Italy's largest lake, and learning that Mussolini's summer retreat, Villa Feltrinelli, was on the opposite shore. Unfortunately, one of the overloaded ducks sank, carrying 24 men to their deaths. Their remains and the vehicle are still at the bottom 
of Lake Garda. But on May 2nd, the Germans in Italy surrendered. In the rubble-strewn streets of their towns and villages, civilians laughed and cried and hugged their liberators, and the troops went on one magnificent falling down drunken bender. The tent had found a huge cache of beer, wine, schnapps, and champagne, and General A's ordered that two bottles be issued to every man. Here's my father on the right, enjoying the fermented fruits of victory. I'm Flint Whitlock. My father, James, served in the 10th Mountain Division in World War II. And uh, here's a picture of him and a buddy uh, at the end of the war, right after the Germans had surrendered. The 10th Mountain Division had uncovered a cache of uh, German uh, alcoholic beverages, I guess we could say, uh, schnapps, wine, beer, and champagne, and General Hayes who was the commanding general of the 10th, uh, ordered that every man in the division receive two bottles as a way of celebrating the end of the war. So you see my dad in the photo here uh, with a bottle of champagne on the uh, chair there. And then here's one of the actual bottles that was recovered from that cache of liquor. And the champagne bottle and uh, Flint's father's story are part of our new liberated exhibit, which is the story of World War II. And we have here multiple cases to represent the different theaters of the war, as well as the home front. And uh, we encourage you to stop by and take a look and, and get a closer reading of some of the great artifacts that we have on display. The Tenth also celebrated the end of the war in the one way that seemed most appropriate to them. They organized the ski race on the crusty summer snows of Mount Mangart, where Italy Austria and Yugoslavia come together. They challenged each other. Walter Prager, the Dartmouth College ski team coach won. It seemed to be the perfect way to end a war and to begin a new world. But along the road to victory, a thousand men of the tent had died and 4,000 had been wounded. This is the American military cemetery at Florence, Italy, where hundreds of tent men are buried. The survivors who had never lost a battle or given up an inch of ground, began looking towards the future and shaping new careers. Bob Dole became a senator from Kansas and was a Republican candidate for president in 1996. David Brower became president of the Sierra Club. Ben Duke was president of Gates Rubber Company in Denver. Merrill Hastings became publisher of Skiing Magazine and a Denver magazine known as 5280. Bill Bowerman became the University of Oregon track coach and coach of the 1972 U.S. Olympic track team, as well as the founder of the Nike Corporation. And across the country, almost every ski area had at least one Tent Mountain veteran involved in its operation. So what happened to the division at war's end? It was deactivated in November 1945, then briefly reactivated three years later as a training division at Fort Riley, Kansas. In 1985, the 10th came back to life at Fort Drum in upstate New York. At Fort Drum, there's a statue depicting a World War II mountain trooper helping a modern day 10th soldier climb the heights. Today, the 10th is the US Army's most deployed division, having seen duty in Haiti, Somalia, Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and maybe a few others they don't want us to know about yet. In 2016, a battalion of the Colorado Army National Guard was repatched, meaning they became affiliated with the 10th Mountain Division and were authorized to wear the 10th patch. Hundreds of people turned out to see the ceremony held at Camp Hale. Here, veterans of the World War II 10th are attaching 10th patches to the sleeves of the Colorado soldiers. So what's left of Camp Hale? Not much. 75 years later, here are the remains of a field house where once concerts, dances, and sporting events took place. A few foundations and a few buildings exist, but for the most part, nature is reclaiming the site. Camp Hale is mostly an empty valley today, filled with memories. A few miles to the south, along Highway 24, at the top of Tennessee Pass, and the entrance to Ski Cooper, where the division had its advanced ski training. The tent's war memorial stands. At this beautiful spot is a large slab of red granite. 
inscribed with the names of all 1,000 of the young men of the tent who gave their lives for their country. You can see Torger Tokla's name in the upper right-hand corner of the monument here. And every year on Memorial Day, friends and family members and the aged veterans themselves gathered to remember the sacrifices of those men who, when they were young and strong, did everything they could to ensure victory for the Allies in Italy and who lived their lives by the tense wartime motto, Sempre Avante, always forward. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you everyone for your questions for Mr. Flint Whitlock. The first one we're going to ask him is if people can visit Camp Hale today. Yes, Camp Hale uh, is open. It's part of the White River National Forest, and there are roads leading from Highway 24 into the campsite itself. There are some areas of the, of the camp that are technically off limits. There'll be some signs posted uh, because some asbestos was found uh, in the site. And so they had to close part of it while they uh, go through a mitigation process. But uh, it's an amazing place to visit. Uh, it's so quiet and still, but you can, you know, if you listen hard enough, I think you can hear the mountain troopers marching along and, and singing the, the songs that, uh, that they used uh, during their training. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, historic place to go and, and hopefully, you'll have the chance to do that. We have another question that came in about how the men were evaluated for skiing and when they were determined to be battle ready. So in general, how were they uh, evaluated to be good enough to go off to work? Well, the training and the evaluation went on uh, constantly. The men who were um, in the infantry regiments, the 85th, 86th, and 87th uh, were really taught uh, the, the skills of mountaineering, both uh, mountain climbing, snowshoeing, cross country and downhill skiing. And so they were continually being evaluated by their instructors. Of course, most of them were already uh, highly skilled before they got to the tent. And uh, the training just basically um, toughened them up, made them ready to, uh, face any sort of situation that might arise in combat in a, in a mountain setting. Uh, those who were assigned to the artillery battalions and the supply battalion where the mules and horses uh, were, were most uh, valuable were um, trained in, in how to take care of mules, how to, how to uh, break them for, for saddle use. Uh, my dad was in one of the artillery battalions, and although he never told me any stories about him actually handling the mules, I'm, I'm sure he had uh, some adventures with them. They were pretty honorary animals, uh, and fortunately there were a lot of men in the tent who were very uh, skilled at, at working with uh, mules and horses. On that subject of, of the mules and the horses, um, did any of them make it over to Italy? Do you know what, what came of them in that heritage? Yeah, this has been kind of an ongoing discussion that I have had with a number of 10th Mountain veterans. I've had some who say none of the mules went overseas. Uh, they were shipped to Camp Swift, Texas, but did not make the, uh, the uh, uh, transatlantic crossing with the rest of the division. I have talked to other 10th uh, Mountain veterans who said, yeah, there were a few mules that did go across. So the, uh, probably the, the, uh, the vote is still out on that. Uh, once the 10th got to Italy, uh, they bought a lot of mules from the Italians. These mules were uh, quite a bit smaller than the American mules and couldn't carry quite as much. And so um, probably another 25 or 30 percent uh, more mules were needed to carry the same amount of equipment that uh, that the mules in the U.S. had been trained to carry. Um, on that subject of, of fighting in Italy, um, you mentioned that they were part of the last cavalry charge of the army. Um, could you comment a little bit more on, on that battle? And on the 14th of April, 1945, when the division was moving down from the heights of the northern Apennines into the Po River Valley, uh, the 10th Recon uh, squadron was used 
uh, to lead the charge, you might say. And they did it on horseback and muleback through a, a grove of trees. And the Germans were, I guess you could say, waiting for them. And they started uh, firing machine guns and dropping in mortar rounds on the horsemen coming through the trees. And uh, there, were, there were quite a few casualties among both the men and the horses. So uh, it did not go well against uh, modern uh, weapons. Um, it was, it was uh, more successful uh, just by men advancing singly and, and in pairs through the, uh, the wooded terrain there to finally engage the, uh, the Germans. Do you know why they ordered a cavalry charge instead of that. A, yeah, incredible. Well, kind of uh, related to that a little bit in terms of, you know, coming off the, the mountains and just in general, um, you know, fighting in the mountains. Did, did these uh, 10th Mountain Division soldiers experience any uh, altitude changes, like difficulties in there at the various terrain? Uh, can you comment on that? Well, when they were in Colorado training, Camp Hale sits at about 8,500 feet above sea level and the surrounding mountains where they trained were anywhere from 10 to 13,000 feet high. So they were uh, quite well conditioned to operate in high altitudes uh, at that point. After they left Camp Hale in the summer of 44 and went to Texas, uh, within a very short period of time, they lost all their um, uh, ability to uh, deal with high altitudes. And so by the time they got to Italy, uh, they, they pretty much uh, had none of that. But by training again, uh, becoming physically uh, conditioned, uh, they were able to um, take part in the combat in the mountains. Of course, the, the mountains uh, in the Northern Apennines are only about three to 4,000 feet above ski level. So, you know, it was maybe a quarter of what they were uh, used to dealing with when they were in Colorado. So it was uh, something that they, they were able to uh, recondition themselves uh, to be ready for fighting in the, the higher altitudes in Italy. Um, and then our last question uh, coming in is, uh, did your dad or have you ever returned to Italy in the battlegrounds memorial? You know, my dad never never returned to Italy. He uh, and uh, my mother wanted to make the trek. Unfortunately, he died at a young age. He was 57 when he passed away from uh, effects of being a chain smoker. Uh, so he and my mom never made it there. I've been back to Italy many times. Uh, probably my, my most fond memory of a trip back was in 1995 when a a dozen uh, 10th Mountain Troopers said, let's go back to Italy and reclimb Riva Ridge. This was uh, 95, you know, it was basically the, fifth, the 25th anniversary of the end of World War II. I don't know if my math is correct on that. <laughs> um, but it was 50 years uh, since the 10th Mountain had climbed Riva Ridge in 1945. And uh, I kind of wheedled my way in and I was able to climb Riva Ridge with about a dozen of the veterans of the tent who were going back uh, to relive what they had done uh, so many decades earlier. And it was, uh, it was a, a truly uh, memorable experience. Uh, I got a very small sense of what these men had accomplished there. Uh, we did this reclimb in the daytime, they did it at night. Uh, and we had no enemy waiting for us on the top. There was a group of Italians and uh, news reporters and TV camera people waiting for us when we got to the top of River Ridge in 95. So it was a lot less uh, strenuous and a lot less uh, worrying, but it was a, a wonderful memory that I'll, I'll always cherish. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And thank you so much for being here today and, and sharing uh, your knowledge and your stories of the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, we're actually going to turn it over now to uh, Ann Schutz, uh, Assistant Curator of Military, Chris Jurgens, And he's going to show us some of our artifact holdings of the 10th Mountain Division. And then once again, uh, Mr. Flint Whitlock, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time and knowledge. 
Thank you, Tim. Uh, so we're going to do a quick introduction of some of the artifacts in our collection. So as you may or may not know, History Colorado is one half of the 10th Mountain Division Resource Center, along with our partners, the Denver Public Library across the street. They keep track of all the photographs and archival materials, and we have the physical artifacts here in our, uh, in our facility. And what we selected here is uh, just a, a, a showcasing some of the unique equipment that the 10th Mountain Division uh, was, that was designed for them and that they used uh, both in their training at Camp Hale and on deployment in Italy. So I'll just go from left to right here and just give you an overview of some of the common equipment that soldiers would have, would have used in their time with the 10th. Uh, first of all, we have the uh, subject of one of their most famous songs, the rucksack. And this here was actually designed specifically for mountain troops. It's called the Mountain Rucksack. Um, and not only was it designed to carry enough uh, or have enough space to carry everything they would need for uh, multiple day patrols, but it actually had a unique design here too. It sort of mirrors some of the modern rucksacks that you might see for hiking or backpacking in that it has a separate uh, sturdy frame to, to help, keep, uh, help keep everything situated low around the hips. Um, and it also was able, you were able to detach this metal frame here and then pair it up with a couple of pairs of skis and some specially designed clamps uh, and then the rucksacks could be turned into an emergency sled uh, for getting wounded out of a combat zone. We also have here, of course, a set of uh, mountain ski goggles. Uh, these were fur-lined and uh, had an elastic strap to fit around uh, the back of the neck. And uh, they, went, they went through several different iterations of, of these kinds of ski goggles, and this is the final design that they settled on. And basically, it was important to keep cold wind out of the eyes of the soldiers, as well as uh, keep uh, protect their eyes from the uh, effects of not only the, the sun directly, but the sun glinting off of snow while they were out on patrol. And here's a typical 10th Mountain Division patch. It's, of course, a very iconic design. Uh, the blue in the back field is representative of the infantry. The cross bayonets, of course, are uh, also indicative of the infantry, but they also form the Roman numeral 10 for the 10th Mountain Division. And the entire patch is in the shape of a powder keg, again, alluding to uh, the infantry role. And then here we have a system that uh, the 10th Mountain Division used on patrol. Uh, it's a two-part system. You would have a, uh, a, wool, a wool mitten here, and you notice the separate trigger finger. And then there was a corresponding what they called a mitten shell. And this mitten shell also looks like a general mitten here, but had, uh, has an opening here where you can actually take your trigger finger and move it outside of the mitten in case you need to operate your weapon. And so obviously that was an important for them to have at the same time as they wanted to make sure that soldiers had plenty of protection against the snow and the wind. Then here we have uh, a set of gaiters. Now, US Army troops, uh, I mean, in the entire army and all the divisions had gaiters of some kind. Um, this particular set is a, is a ski gaiter. Uh, they're a little bit lower than some of the other sets that the army issued. And uh, of course, uh, faded a little bit with age here, but the color was originally white, obviously, to help uh, with, with camouflaging the soldiers. And uh, the purpose of these gaiters was twofold. I mean, the one was to help protect the hardware on the actual boots. Uh, specifically, the, the lacing would be contained underneath the front of the gaiter and make sure nothing snags there. Um, but then it was also to help keep snow out of the top of the boots, which, of course, is important for the uh, 10th Mountain Division. And then back here, we have some other uh, pieces of equipment that are unique uh, to the 10th Mountain. Uh, for example, this here, of course, is a mountain piton. Uh, a lot of these are manufacturer marked on the side, uh, so that's how you can tell a, a wartime issued one. And uh, these you can actually still find in the cliff sides of Camp, of Camp Hale, uh, where they were originally placed during training in World War II. Next, we have another pretty innocuous item, but another one distinct to the division, and that is a, uh, a mountain brush, as, as they called it. Um, which is a brush that was specifically designed to just get snow off of equipment, skis, and even the bottom of your tent. Next, we have probably the most distinctive piece of equipment that everyone will recognize quickly in, in pictures of the 10th Mountain Division, and that's the ski mountain boot. And uh, a veteran actually wrote into us back in the 80s saying that, you know, like most things that the Army designed that were uh, designed for two different purposes, they were particularly, not particularly good for either one. And uh, in this case, it was so a ski mountain boot was intended to have uh, aggressive treads, as you can see here, uh, for mountain terrain and, and hiking. And uh, these rubber soles were actually made by Goodyear. Um, but at the same time, they were intended to be used as ski boots. So you can notice here uh, some of the distinctive parts are like these metal clips here that are supposed to help protect the boot against the ski bindings, uh, and this very angular design that helps keep the bindings in place. You should also note, actually, that the uh, that distinctive front here, that very boxy large front. Uh, part of that reason, too, is that they wanted soldiers to be able to wear multiple pairs of these wool socks if needed. 
And then here we have another piece of distinctive equipment, and that is the mountain parka. And so what's kind of neat about this piece is, once again, the Army wanted to be efficient and wanted to have equipment be usable for multiple, uh, for, for multiple situations. Uh, the parka is actually entirely reversible. And so on the one side is white uh, for camouflaging against the snow, and then the other side is this olive drab that, is the standard, uh, that was the standard military uh, clothing color at the time. And then finally, back here, we have a ski skin. Now, the ski skin was, uh, I mean, th these, are, these are pieces of equipment that are still, of course, in use today. Um, and it basically allows a skier to climb up slight inclines. Uh, you would attach them to the bottom of the ski, usually with some kind of an adhesive. And uh, these ones here are made of mohair, which is a, a, an artificial fur uh, that lies flat in the one direction and stands up in the other to help uh, create friction and keep the skis in place. They're called ski skins because originally those, uh, that fabric side was actually made with uh, seal skin. Um, but as the war dragged on and, and the, the amount of equipment required increased, uh, they started looking for uh, artificial alternatives. And then finally, we have a couple of pieces here that just help illustrate kind of the unique role that division has in terms of uh, its legacy and history that is, is unlike any other division in, in the U.S. Army. Um, and that is the uh, tremendously enthusiastic and dedicated uh, descendants and, and association uh, that the 10th Mountain Division has. So... What they actually have here, what we have here is two examples of commemorative coins, or medals, I guess, uh, that were given to veterans and their families who traveled back to Italy with the association where they would go and do battlefield tours. And uh, that's something that continues to this day, although, of course, fewer and fewer veterans are able to join uh, themselves. Their families still go on these, on these annual pilgrimages and uh, are, are very active in maintaining the 10th Mountain Division history and legacy here in Colorado.